Okay, what we want to do today is pick up our discussion again of the sources and uses of bank funds. Uh, you remember we've got this simple model of a bank really and uh, it's showing where the funds are coming from. The deposits, borrowing, and then capital. Now, so the dollars come in from these various sources. At that moment that a depositor makes a deposit or a lender loans money to the bank or an owner hands money over to the bank, at that moment the bank's got cash, right? And so those are assets, those dollars, that cash is an asset and the bank could just sit there and hold on to that cash and that could be the end of the story. The only thing is, if a bank just holds on to cash and does nothing else with it, then that bank is not going to be able to pay interest to depositors, interest to uh, the lenders, and is not going to be able to turn up, uh, profits back to the owners. And so they, <coughs> excuse me, they're not going to just hold cash. But at that moment, they acquire assets, and some of those dollars, some of that cash, they do continue holding on to in the reserve accounts, for example. If you go into a bank and they have dollars in the vault, that's cash. And so as we start working our way down, we'll talk about four different categories of bank assets, and I'll talk about each one. The first one we'll call primary reserves. These primary reserves, everything in this category constitutes liquid assets and they earn no interest. And this one include just the dollars in the vault, for example. But it includes dollars deposited at the Federal Reserve. And so let me put here is uh, legal reserves. By the way, I use the term twice now, so let me use quote marks here on this primary reserves. These are unofficial terms. I don't mean to say that the Federal Reserve or banks have to label them this way. These are terms that money and banking professors use to basically break all these assets into categories, into functional categories. What do they mean? What is their purpose for being held? And so legal reserves is just a label that we are attaching. Legal reserves, did I say legal twice? Primary reserves are liquid assets that earn no interest, and legal reserves are either at the Fed, let's say in the vault, or at the Fed. And in the one case, the, the dollars in the vault, that is just cash. That's $10 bills, $20 bills, and so forth. Okay, and when I say in the vault, I would also mean the cash drawers of the tellers and so forth, but it's on the premises, it's cash. And these funds that are at the Federal Reserve and their legal accounts, and their legally maintained reserve accounts, these are deposits that are there and then the Federal Reserve says, okay, we got it and we'll give you credit. And the bank treats that as cash. Okay, now, I'll say A1, A2. A1 is required reserves. Okay, and by required reserves, I mean this. It's a certain percent of checking account uh, deposits. And so, to go back, when people put money in the bank into a deposit, if it's in a savings account or a time deposit, there is no reserve the bank has to maintain. But if you put money into a demand deposit or a now account, the banker must maintain reserves against that. And the reserves can be in the vault or they can be at the Fed, but there has to be a reserve. What percent? And the answer is, it depends on how big the bank is. For the smallest banks, this is a 3% reserve. And for the medium size and large banks, it's 10%. Now, 
Most banks, you know, we've got, what, 7,000 banks. Most banks are small banks. But most deposits, like if we just went out and said, hey, how much are in checking de uh, deposits in all the banks in the United States, around $700 billion, most of that $700 billion is in medium-sized banks and large banks. The small banks collectively, I think all the small banks, probably if you looked at 6,600 small banks in the United States, the community banks, all of them collectively maybe hold as much in checking deposits as one, you know, Bank of America. And that's not for sure, but something on that order. And so what I'm saying to you is most checking accounts are held at medium size and large banks, so most the dollar value of checking accounts. So most deposits are subject to that 10% reserve requirement. Okay, but then the smaller banks are maintaining a smaller reserve requirement. And to a great extent, this is political. The Federal Reserve uh, and the legislation that authorizes the Federal Reserve to require the uh, reserves, it is saying, you know, we can make a lot of banks happy, thousands and thousands, by having this lower requi reserve requirement. And so we'll just kind of do that and keep them you know, feeling kind of good about the whole system. It's not punitive. This is, the bankers thinking this, whoever, whichever size bank it is, somebody makes a deposit, I have to set some of this aside and not get interest. Gosh, I don't like that. And the higher this reserve ratio, then the more we set aside. The other 90% is going to be loaned out or invested in bonds, for example, and earn interest. And so the higher this ratio, if this were a 50% ratio, we could only take 50% of it and make loans and buy bonds, investments. And so the lower this is, the more banks like it. Okay, so anyway, that's required reserves. Um, most of these reserves are not kept in the vault. Think about this. Over time, what happens is our banking system grows. Not rapidly, but over time, the banking system grows. Over time, there's more and more deposits at banks, and the bank's total assets are growing. And if the deposits are growing over time, then what that means is each year, there's more money put into deposits than is withdrawn. That's how the bank grows, is more comes in than goes out. And so over time, since there's more deposits being made than withdrawals, then that means on the average day, not every day, but on the average day, more deposits coming in than are being withdrawn. And that means on the average day, a banker could start up with almost nothing in the vault, and yeah, there's going to be somebody come in and say, I want to withdraw money from my account, but on that average day, there'll be more people coming in making deposits. And so on the average day, the bank doesn't need a lot in the vault. This money sitting around in the vault is just something, you know, that's got to be managed. Somebody's got to do something with it, and if you kept all your reserves in the vault, you need a bigger vault, okay? And so we don't need too much. And it's also subject to embezzlement or theft or worms eating, I don't know what happens to it. And so the banker's going to keep a modest amount in the vault. Now, by modest amount, I don't mean to say modest to you or me. You know, for me, 50,000 bucks would be a whole lot of cash. And for a banker, not so much. But what I'm saying to you is there could be a bank that's holding $100 million worth of deposits, and they're not going to keep like $1 million just sitting around. They just don't need it. Most of these reserves are going to the Federal Reserve. Now, let me come back then. Let's say that a deposit is made. We'll take a simple example. Let's say that a deposit is made of $100. And the banker, in the first instance, I mean, boom, right now, they get that $100. They say, let's put this in the cash drawer. Let's put it in the vault. At that moment, that's $100 of cash that counts as reserves. And at that moment, before anything else can be done, the banker says, hey, I only have to hold $10 on reserve. I am holding $100. I only have to hold $10. And so the remainder would be an excess reserve. And so these legal reserves, you either have to hold them or you don't. And since we're not getting interest, and the Federal Reserve does sometimes pay interest on these reserves, but it's a very low rate. Since we're getting little or no interest on these reserves, 
what bankers are going to say is, I would rather not. I would rather not have excess reserves. But that, I mean, at the first instance, you have no choice. Somebody comes in and says, here, I want to deposit $100 in the account. You say, okay. At that moment, you say, okay, you have got excess reserves. But as quickly as possible, banks will get rid of these excess reserves and use them to make a loan or do something else that we're going to talk about. But excess reserves would be dollars in the vault or at the Fed that do not have to be held. They are not required. Okay? So anyway, uh, let's go on to a second category, second component of these primary reserves. To be a primary reserve, it's got to be liquid assets, either cash or near cash, but earn no interest. Here's number two. Okay. Um, CIPC equals check items in the process of collection. These are liquid because they don't exist for very long. And that is just what it sounds like, check items in the process of collection. Here's what happens. Here we've got a bank. We're just sitting around, taking it easy, chatting at the water cooler. Somebody walks in and says, hey, I've got a paycheck from work. I want to put this in my account. You say, okay. How much? They say $1,000. And they give us a deposit. Here's $1,000 coming in. We say, okay, thank you. We give them a deposit slip. You know, they're going to have to wait to actually get credit on this for a couple days. But anyway, we give them a deposit slip and they go away. And they know they can get this money in a couple days. What we do before the day is over, we at our bank here, is we say, let's send this away to be collected. It's a check clearing process. So we send that check away, 1000 bucks, And maybe it's written on, I don't know, a construction company or a manufacturing company or a retail store. Wherever this depositor, wherever they work, their employer gave them a paycheck. And so what we're basically going to do is send this check away back to the employer's bank to collect on this. Now, where's the employer? The employer could be here in town or their bank. Could be here in town. The employer could be in another state. Could be on the opposite side of the United States. So where we send it depends on where we are. If the employer, let's say that this, uh, this depositor came in and gave us a check and they work for a local construction company and the local construction company has a bank here in town, then what we would do is basically take this check at the end of the day and meet with the other banks in town and say, hey, we've got $23,400 worth of checks written on you. And they'd say, well, we have $23,000 of checks written on you. And then we would hand those over and there's only $1,000 or $300 that needs to be actually somebody pay somebody else. And we're netting these out against each other. And the banks are getting together within a little community kind of a deal. And then what they'll do at that point is settle up on reserves. They will tell the Federal Reserve, hey, take $1,300 out of my reserve account, that reserve account at the Fed, and transfer it to that other bank. If, if this depositor comes in and gives us a paycheck, and it doesn't have to be a paycheck, just any kind of a check, written on a bank far away, more likely we're going to send this check off to the Federal Reserve and say, we want to collect on this. And the Federal Reserve will say, okay, and send that check back to the other bank and give us credit for it and debit the other bank's reserve account at the Fed. So we're going to see credit show up as our reserves at the Fed. Now, I'm giving you a little bit of the mechanics of this. Here's the key, though. Let's say it takes us, we'll just say hypothetically, two days to get credit for this check. A depositor gave us a check, we sent it away, and there's two days that that check is gone. It's out of our hands, and we're waiting for the Federal Reserve to credit us. So for those two days, what we would do is we would enter $1,000 here. We don't immediately say, oh, I've got $1,000 at the Fed. A customer gave me $1,000. I handed that check over to the Fed. I get $1,000. Not yet. There's two days in there in our little story here where we say, 
I'm going to get a thousand bucks two days from now. And so for those two days, we'd say, we've got a check in the process of collection, and we'd enter it right here. It's a liquid asset because the money will be here soon, and it'll go into this legal reserves, probably excess, but anyway, it'll go in as our legal reserves at the Fed two days from now, but for those two days, we don't have it. We've just got, and it's not called this, but it's comparable to an account receivable. Huh, in two days we're going to receive some money, but not yet. And so then two days from now, the Federal Reserve would say to us, hey, we credited your reserve account, and so now we have legal reserves at the Fed. And then we would wipe this $1,000 off. That's no longer in the process of collection. It's been collected. Okay, now, the, Fed, uh, the banks don't like this. It's like, hey, I have to wait to get my money, and I'm not getting interest on it. It's very liquid. I'm going to get paid in two days. I earn no interest. I don't like it. But how can I avoid this? The only way to avoid it is just tell customers, no, I'm not taking that check. Well, we can't tell customers that. We're done as a bank if that's what we say. No. So we just live with it. Too bad. And the thing is, two days from now when we go, oh, now I get to write that off, somebody else comes in and make another deposit, and we've got this again while that's sent away. We have always got check items in the process of collection. There's always a certain number of thousands of dollars or whatever that we have just got set, you know, we're sitting around waiting while this check is out of our possession. It's gone away. And now we're using images of these, and this process is sped up. Back in the old days, I'm going to say 30, 40 years ago, these had to be physically moved across the country. Now, not the ones lo locally within your town, but 30, 40 years ago, they would bundle these up, take them out to the airport, put them on an airplane, fly them to St. Louis or Chicago or Philadelphia, wherever your uh, Federal Reserve Bank was, and... If there's snow and that plane doesn't take off, then you're just sitting there hoping they get the runway cleared off. And it would uh, slow this process down of these checks, items, in the process of collection. And the further it is away, the more problem you have with, I don't know, whether it be snowed in runways or whatever, delays, bad weather. And so now we've gone to the imaging and it speeds all this stuff up, but we still have check items in the process of collection for a short amount of time. Liquid asset earns no interest. C, correspondent balances at other banks. Usually, but not always, not always, but usually there's some small bank, the bank we're talking about here as it turns out, and the small bank goes to a bigger bank and says, hey, could you help us with something? Well, what would that be? And the answer is, the something will emerge in the course of that discussion. Could be anything at all. But the basic problem is this. If we have this bank that's of modest size, I don't know, $50, $100 million in assets, it's a pretty unsophisticated operation, and it's not like we're not smart enough to do it. It's just that it's too costly for us to produce certain services in-house. And so we might go to another bank and say, I know you're doing this or that all the time, would you help us and do that for us? Now, let me give you two examples of what that might be. It might be check clearing. It might be that we say, hey, we've got some checks. Depositors gave us checks. We need to send those away to have them collected. This bank is always doing this, this big bank across town. They're always doing that kind of stuff. Let's hand our checks over to them, and they have a department to do this. They've got all the machinery and the computers and things like that, and they can do this for us. Yes, we could send them away to the Federal Reserve, but we could send it to this bank, and they can do the same thing as the Federal Reserve, and maybe at a lower fee. And so that might be something we want the big bank to do for us, a service. Here's another service that is very common. 
something called loan participation. You know, we've talked before about risk and how we can reduce risk by diversifying. If you're running this small bank, $100 million in assets in a modest-sized town, and you're thinking, I'm making loans, but gosh, all these loans are kind of being made here in my town, maybe, or in this county. I'm not geographically diversified very much. I kind of wish I could loan on the East Coast or the West Coast or further away, South America. I wish I could diversify my risk, not be making all my loans in a small area, but that's hard to do. So we might go to this big bank and say, hey, I heard that you're lending money to General Electric and their headquarters over on the East Coast. Or I heard that you're making loans to the government of Brazil. And the banker says, yeah, that's true. And then you might say to them, you, how about like letting me share a little bit of this action you're having? And the action would be, how much are you lending to Brazil? Oh, a billion dollars. Well, would you be willing to let me have one million dollars of action out of that billion dollar loan? And what this banker is thinking, we are thinking at our little bank, we cannot afford to put a loan officer out there and like pay for their transportation and pay for all their traveling expenses, you know, like the food and the hotel and stuff like this. We can't afford that if we were just going to like lend a million dollars. Because let's face it, if you went to Brazil and spent a week there and made a few calls on somebody and said, we were successful, we, we made the loan, and you, there's no guarantee of success. But if you were successful, maybe you spent $5,000. And if you spent 5000 bucks to book this $1 million loan, that's kind of a lot. And this banker here might send somebody down to Brazil and make a billion dollar loan, a thousand times as big as our $1 million loan. And even though it's a thousand times as big, maybe they only spend ten times as much money making that loan. So we say to them, hey, how about letting us have a little bit of that action? And they say, okay, how much do you want? One, two, five, ten, twenty million dollars, fifty million dollars, however much you want. And we say, one million's enough. Well, here's the deal. When our small bank needs services that we cannot produce internally, cannot efficiently produce internally, and some big bank is doing that, we can go to them and say, we'd like to work something out with you. And the big bank says, you know, we'd be willing to work something out with you, but we'd kind of like to have an ongoing relationship with you. And we say, okay, because I need to keep on clearing checks. I need to participate in some loans. There can be other things as well. And so the big bank says, let's sit down here and kind of talk about what we think might uh, happen over the next year. And we talk about it, and the big banker might say, you know, from all these things we've talked about, I think I would be probably charging you about $10,000 as a fee for all these things. Let's use an easier number, $5,000. I might charge you $5,000 as a fee for all this, but I'm not going to charge you a fee. I normally have to pay about 5% to attract money. That's this big banker talking. I normally have to pay about 5% to attract money. So I'll tell you what. If you had $100,000 just sitting here on my bank and you never took it out, you just left it alone, then I'd be kind of getting, it'd be the equivalent of me giving you these services and that would be the equivalent of me getting about or paying about 5%, I'd be giving you $5,000 of the services on a $100,000 deposit. That'd be about the equivalent of me paying 5% for funds. And so the banker says to us, the big banker says, I'll tell you what you do. You make a deposit of $100,000, and you just leave that there year, all the year round. We're not going to give you a penny's worth of interest, and then, as these things come up, we'll give you these services. And we have talked it over, and we've kind of made some estimates. Now, if you need other services, you let us know, and that'll be fine. And we can adjust this balance that you need to maintain at the bank. We can adjust that as we go. 
And so if something comes up, like for example, you hire some new employee and they're gonna be a loan officer and they don't have the experience, and we're teaching our loan officers, you know, we'll send them to some school or maybe in-house we have a school for them, you can send your employee over, that's okay. We'll just work it out as we go. We're pals. We're coup de la. And so, anyway, that's it. This is called correspondent banking. This bank that receives the deposit is the correspondent. And the bank that receives services and makes a deposit is the respondent bank. Now those services, I mean, this doesn't all happen at the same moment. What happens is when we shake hands on the deal, then the deposit is made, boom, at that moment, and now we have the relationship. And then these services will be delivered off and on throughout the year. Okay, so anyway, back to our story. This bank that we're talking about, we're managing a small bank. We needed correspondent services. And so we are the ones that open the account, put the deposit in the other bank. And now, at that point, we have a deposit at another bank. We can have it back whenever we want. We could just call them up and say, hey, you know how we get that deal? Give the money back. Because this is like a checking account. So it is liquid if we want it, but we are not earning interest. We're getting back services. Okay, now let me just mention a couple of things to go with this story. And the one is this. It doesn't have to be small bank, big bank. They can be the same size. It could be that a big bank makes, uh, has a correspondent account with a small bank. Anything can happen. Okay, it's this deposit and the provision of services in return that defines the correspondent relationship regardless of the size of the bank. The other thing I would say is this. Virtually every bank in the United States, and I am just saying, we don't see this. We're retail customers. We walk in, we make a deposit, we get a car loan or whatever, and that's all we see of the bank. But behind the scenes, virtually every bank in the United States is either a correspondent or a respondent or both. You could have a bank in Springfield, Missouri that opens a correspondent account with a bank in St. Louis, Missouri, and the Springfield Bank's a respondent, the St. Louis Bank is a correspondent, but then this St. Louis Bank maybe sends a deposit off to a New York Bank or a Chicago Bank and gets services in return, and in that transaction, this is the respondent bank, and the bank in New York or Chicago would be the correspondent. And so what we have is this network of banks behind the scenes that connects. Now, every bank isn't connected to every other bank, but every bank's connected to this correspondent uh, network someplace or another. Okay? One of the things I already mentioned to you is this, is that banks can purchase Fed funds from other banks. You remember the borrowing of dollars? That's one thing that happens. It may be that the respondent says to the correspondent, hey, we sometimes have just money sitting around and we're not earning interest. If we get some of that, could we just send that to you and you pay us interest? That is, could we sell Fed funds to you? And that bank says, any day. All you do, you just send them to us. Just assume it automatically. You don't have to call me up every day. At 4 o'clock every day, if you've got any money, any Fed funds you want to sell us, you just tell the Federal Reserve to transfer it over and send us a note in this network that we have. You just send us a note. We know exactly what it is. That'll be our regular deal. And that could be a part of this whole relationship as well. So this is going on all the time. Questions about this? So what we have is liquid assets, no interest. And for the most part, these things are pretty regular here. It's like we've got a correspondent account. We know how much that is, $100,000 or a million dollars or whatever it would be, and that just sets there. This is a certain percent of just the deposits that are coming in. This is a certain percent of the deposits that come in that we have to set aside. This is the one, though, 
where that, and I'll go back to the example, somebody comes in and make a deposit of $100, we have to set aside 10. Now we got 90 in excess reserves, and for one minute we got excess reserves. And I'm saying that is the one that we can avoid. This is avoidable. These really aren't the others, A1 and B and C. We, can, we really need these as a part of doing business. And these are avoidable, these excess reserves. So in most cases, by the time the day is done, we're rid of them. Did you get that? By the time the day is over, we're rid of these things. We do not like excess reserves. They're just sitting around taking up space. Now, how do we get rid of them? I'm glad you asked. Let's go to category two. Banks have to be liquid, right? Two reasons. And by the way, we just talked about some liquid assets. Banks have to be liquid for two reasons. One is this. When people make a deposit, we're promising them you can have your money back. And we've got to live by that promise. If we take somebody's deposit and say, oh, you can have your money back anytime you want, and then they come in and go, Hey, I put $1,000 in my account last week. Could I have that? And you go, no, I'm sorry. We just don't have it. What? I need that. I was counting on it. And we're counting on that, right? If you've got rent to pay or whatever, you've got expenses, insurance payment to make, and you put that money in the bank and you thought you could go by and get it, and they just say no. Now you can't make a house payment. Now you can't pay your insurance bill. That relationship is just damaged forever. And so that bank has to do that. They can't just go, oh, come back next week. We'll be better off then. No, no, no. So that's the first reason banks have to be liquid, to satisfy these people. The second reason they have to be liquid is this, and we're not to it yet, but where they make their big profits is making loans. And they always want to say, yes. If a good customer comes in and says, I want to borrow some money, they always want to say, okay, have a seat. They don't want to go, gosh, I'm sorry, if I, if I had money, I'd lend it to you, but I just don't. They never want to say that, ever. Because you know what that person does? A person says, okay, bye, person or company. And they go across the street and borrow the money over there, and then they have a relationship with that bank over there, and that's where they go from now on. You always want to say, well, sure. So what I'm saying is this, the bank has to be liquid, has to. Now, these were liquid assets, the primary reserves. Three of those four items that I mentioned, the A1 and B and C, three of the four are liquid, but we really can't do much about handing those over to somebody else. We kind of have to hold on to that liquidity. We still need some liquid assets. Okay, and so these secondary reserves are liquid assets, but they this is our no interest, but they earn interest. Earn positive interest. Let me give you a few examples. And I don't mean for this to be everything possible, but a few examples. Sell Fed funds. You've heard about Fed funds before. Here's where we talked about Fed funds earlier. We said that if a bank wants to borrow some dollars, obtain some funds, they could purchase Fed funds and get dollars from another bank. True. But now we're talking about if a bank has some dollars and they want to put those dollars to work, one place they can put them to work is lend them to another bank on an overnight basis, right, one day, and you're transferring funds that are at the Federal Reserve. That's why they call them Fed funds. These are funds on the books of the Federal Reserve for an overnight basis, and they're unsecured. There's no collateral. 
Okay, so let me go back. I told you if somebody makes a deposit and we say, oh, we've got excess reserves. If you've got no place else to put those excess reserves, don't hold on to excess reserves. Before the day is over, sell Fed funds to another bank. Say, hey, you want some funds? And there's some bank out there that says, I sure do. And even if you can't find some bank that does, you call your correspondent up and you say, hey, you know, we got a deal where I can sell Fed funds. And the banker said, I told you, don't bring that up all the time. Of course I will. Just transfer them to me. I'll pay you. And of course, that bank will, if it doesn't need them, will sell Fed funds to another bank. These dollars are just snapping around the country. We're talking, it could be of any amount, but we're talking of a Fed funds market that's billions and billions and billions of dollars. It's very efficient, and dollars flow very quickly. So anyway, these are liquid assets. We can have the money back tomorrow, and they're earning interest. That's better than a liquid asset that earns no interest. That is to say, the uh, what excess reserves sitting at the Federal Reserve or sitting in the vault just doing nothing. No, get rid of those. Sell them to another bank. Here's another possibility. Well, let me mention two of these before I go on. There's Fed funds of two types, the overnight or the one day, and that's typical. But there's also such a thing as term Fed funds, and the term Fed funds have a maturity date, a week, a month, a year, well, not a year. In theory, any maturity, whatever's agreed on. But anyway, usually not a long term. Okay. No collateral, though. Here's another possibility. We've used this term in another way before, so here we are again using that term in a slightly different way. Suppose you think this, I've got some cash in the vault, there are excess reserves, I want them to put them to work, I want to sell Fed funds to another bank, but gosh, I don't know if that other bank is safe, I don't know if I'm going to get my money back. Fed funds transactions have no collateral, I'll just loan you that money for one day, you pay me back tomorrow, and then we'll just start rolling them over. I wonder if I'm going to get my money back. So I might want collateral. And so what I could say to you is this. Hey, want to purchase Fed funds? And you say, okay. Another bank says, okay. And I say, just a second. I want you to give me some collateral. And that banker says, okay. But then that other banker says, just a second. We've got a definition of Fed funds. You loan me the money, I give you no collateral. That's uncollateralized. Now, they don't say it that way, but Fed funds, no collateral. So what we'll say is something like this. Tell you what I'll do. I'll give you, let's say, 100000 or a $1 million. I'll give you $100,000 worth of federal funds, Fed funds. You give me some Treasury bills as collateral. I'll hold on to that Treasury bill, and then tomorrow or next week or whenever it is that we get done with our deal, you pay me what you owe me, plus interest, and I'll give back your collateral. Now that is a tr Fed funds transaction with collateral, but they don't call it Fed funds transaction with collateral. Here's what they call it, a repurchase agreement. Because here's another way of looking at the same transaction. Here's $100,000, I will purchase some treasury bills from you, and then in a week or a month or whenever it is, you repurchase these treasury bills from me, here they are back, and now you give me $1,000 plus interest. And so it was a repurchase agreement. But all that amounts to, in this particular case, is a collateralized Fed funds transaction. So these are both Fed funds deals. Okay? Anyway, I can get rid of this money. I'm just saying, I don't have to sit around a secondary, or with uh, excess reserves. I can get rid of that money before the day is over. Other things to do with it would be something like this. Purchase treasury bills. These are just a short-term kind of a treasury bond. 
but they're called treasury bills. They're very short term. From the longest, I mean, treasury bills when they're issued either have a three month, six month, or a 12 month maturity. There's none of them long term. And then if we buy one that's already been out there for a while, it has an even shorter period of time until it matures. Right? If I buy a three month treasury bill that's been in circulation already for two months, now it only has one month to go to maturity. Or how about this one? I could purchase a negotiable CD issued by another bank. CD, certificate of deposit. Maybe there's some big bank, a city bank or um, Bank of America, and they've got some CDs and they're in circulation out there. I could buy one of those, sit around, hold on to it, earn some interest. If I ever want to, I can sell it for cash. I want liquid assets here because I need to be liquid. I always have to say yes to the depositor who wants to withdraw money. I always have to say yes if I want to make a loan. So I need some liquid assets. But I could hold, and this is really not much different than just the idea of a bond. I can hold a CD issued by some other bank. How about this one? Purchase commercial paper. Commercial paper is issued by an industrial company or a financial company. And it's kind of like, kind of like, but not exactly, but kind of like a bond. And it's got some amount up here, like let's say $100,000, and there'll be some interest rate of, I don't know, 3%, and then there'll be some maturity date, six months hence on it. And maybe this is issued by, I don't know, a utility company. Or maybe it's issued by, um, uh, I don't know, what, GE Capital, is that it? Some financial company? And what happens is there's somebody, an industrial company or some financial company, and they say, we need some funds. They need funds. And they print up their own IOU, so to speak, commercial paper is what this is called. And then they say, hey, we have this commercial paper for sale. And so our bank, we've got a little bit of liquidity here. Our bank can go out and buy some of this commercial paper. And we're holding on to this. And we're getting interest. So it satisfies this uh, requirement here of earning interest. It's liquid because it's issued by a fairly big company. We can sell this thing. And it's also liquid because it has a short maturity. The maturity is always less than nine months by law for this commercial paper. If its maturity is nine months or over, it qualifies as a bond. And there are all kinds of other Securities and Exchange uh, Commission, SEC, restrictions on it. And so these are always short term. That adds liquidity. And then they are marketable. And that adds liquidity. Issued by big companies, that adds liquidity to it. Okay, guess what? These are not very much different from each other. This is kind of like the IOU of the Treasury, and they're borrowing money for short periods of time and paying interest. And this is the IOU of another bank, and they're borrowing money for a short period of time, and it's liquid. We can sell it to somebody. And this is the IOU of an industrial company or a financial company, and they are borrowing and paying interest, and we can sell it. These are all very similar to each other. And by the way, these are also the kinds of things, and we haven't talked about it, but a money market mutual fund, a money market mutual fund is taking money of investors and investing it in liquid assets, exactly these kind of things right here. This is what money market mutual funds invest in. This is what banks invest in or purchase when they need to be liquid. We could add more things here, but I'm not going to continue with this list. These are the important ones. So basically, what I'm saying is this. Banks have to be liquid, no question. So they hold liquid assets. They do not like to hold liquid assets that earn no interest. So to the extent possible, they get rid of those excess reserves and tie their liquidity up in secondary reserves if they need liquidity. And so this is the kind of stuff that they do with their money. OK? Now. There's a certain point where the bankers have all the liquidity they need. 
Let's finish up with this little point right here and then we'll stop. Bankers get all the liquidity they need with primary reserves and secondary reserves. Whatever they need, they need. But you can never count on how much liquidity you need, so you always got to have some. After you've got all the liquidity you need that's reasonable, then what you say is this. Okay, you know, I've got that nailed. I've got that taken care of. Now, I, my next consideration is profit. And the most profitable thing I can do, I'll put a star up here, the most profitable thing I can do is make loans. So what I want to do is lend all the money I can that I believe will be paid back I want to make as many loans as I can. And so when we go back to this deal again of a deposit comes in, we hold the required reserves. If there are any excess reserves, yes, we'll hold secondary reserves if we need it. But if we don't need any more liquidity, then what we do is we just say, hey, excess reserves, let's make loans. And this is, of all those dollars coming into the banks, this is about 65% of all of the funds coming into banks, two-thirds practically, ends up as loans. And this is the most profitable category of bank assets. We're going to talk about loans next time. So long. <laughs>